Hey everyone, I'm Sebastian. I'm going to show you how to find the medial meniscus of your knee on your own knee. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to use bony landmarks, all right? Bony landmarks are the easiest way to tell where a good starting point is. And I'll scooch up just a tad so you can make sure to see the remainder of my knee. The first bony landmark we can use is the kneecap. Everybody knows what the kneecap is, all right? It's a little, it's a little teardrop-shaped muscle right into here. Just know that everything here and on top is not your meniscus, all right? Everything here on top is not your meniscus. The meniscus can be accessed a little bit more from the sides. The next reference point you can make is you can take your hand right down into here and then start to start on like kind of that that divot part of the leg and you're going to roll up and it's going to feel bone 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 line there's a line here why is this line soft this is the joint line this is the joint line of the knee and you can actually hold it down and kind of rub around a little bit and then you're going to find as you start to work your way back it may start to become more tender or it might just all of a sudden disappear. It's harder to feel back into here, but essentially what we're doing is in this model, this is, this is our knee, okay? This is the kneecap here. Uh, this is the, uh, this, this is, I guess is the flip mirror model. This is that gully that we just talked about. It's in the inner part of the knee. And then as you start to work your way up here, you run into that divot. See that joint line right there? Okay, uh, a good reference point is this other side of the knee because this one you can see it was called the tibial plateau. This is like a plateau like you'd find in Utah, all right, the, those big bluffs they have, it's, a, it's flat. And so you go up into there and everything sitting on there is going to be uh, the meniscus and uh, internal joint line. On the back side of the knee, there are, the, um, there are ways to access this a little bit more so, but as you can see, we're running over structures like the... Uh, like the uh, MCL, ACL, uh, sorry, MCL and LCL, so the uh, ligaments on the side. So <clears throat> what you could do, though, is you can feel into those areas here. This Again, this is the medial meniscus. You can feel the same thing on the outer half here. As you go through and you find the joint line all the way up and you find a little bit of uh, a divot point. So you're going to pay really close attention, almost like you were uh, like really meditating to find this out. Uh, pay close attention to where those lines go. And as you start to get into here, it's going to be a little harder. But you can essentially, you, once you find this hamstring tendon right into here, you're going to get a little lost. But overall, just find your reference point back and start following all the way back. Do the same thing over here. This is the hamstring tendon as well, way down into here. So you can still access that point all the way to back down into here. All right. So the, media, uh, the meniscus is, uh, if you guys don't know what it is, uh, it's actually like a cushion in the knee, and it helps your knee uh, provide some height. It's a, it's, a, it's a cushion for things like bouncing, but also it helps out with knee mechanics too. Um, a lot of people with knee meniscus problems, they tend to have uh, swelling that happens about a day or so, or even a couple hours after they have their initial problem, like they, like they step down. Uh, and they feel a tweak in the knee, and all of a sudden on the inner part of the knee, right around here, they start to feel some like swelling, but it's really not a lot. You'll certainly still be able to see the kneecap, okay? Now, if you had something like an ACL injury, uh, y your knee would look like a ball. Like it wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't see a lot of kneecap and definition. It'd be hard to find these structures that we just talked about. So <clears throat> the good news is that if you have something like a, a low-level medial meniscus injury, it's, it's most of the time it's not surgical. Surgical meniscal, uh, meniscal injuries are typically um, more what we call bucket handle tears, or the presentation uh, that people tend to have is they walk in like so, okay? So they go, they go like this. They can't, they can't bend the knee this way or this way. They can't go either direction. It's not just like, you know, it hurts back here, and then like this way is okay, and you know, it's not like there's range of motion in one direction and, and, and not the other. It's locked and fixed like it, was, like it was encased in stone. It's stuck. It's not moving. And that's what we would deem maybe a little bit more of a surgical case. The good news is that everybody else is a rehab case still proven otherwise. What we found that with meniscus is a lot of times meniscus don't like rotation. Okay? So in this model, this guy right here, um, this a lot of times will create irritation. 
which, is, which explains why if you're laying in bed and your foot gets caught in the sheet, but your body continues to turn over it, then it creates irritation. It's the shin staying fixed while the remainder of the body twists over it. So what we need to do a lot of times with people with knee injuries, especially meniscus, is we need to make it so it becomes more tolerant to rotation. And the easiest way to do that is to shift some of the rotational demand above or below the knee. That's going to be the hip or the foot ankle complex. Okay. The easiest thing to do for most people is going to be the hip. Okay. The foot ankle complex is not impossible to do, but it takes a little bit more uh, attention. Uh, and if you were looking to do both, that's not a bad idea. Um, but you would oftentimes need a lot more coaching on this than when you would on the hip. Okay. The easiest thing you can do on the hip is, is create uh, what we call um, more hip range of motion or availability. This doesn't make the hip strong, but it makes it more available. We do find a lot of people that are rotationally intolerant in the knee tend to respond really well to adding more extension and internal rotation to the hip. For a um, presentation pattern, if you do something like this, or you squat down and it bothers it, if you do something like a hip extension stretch, a lot of times it does help out a lot. So here's how we would do it. You would just lean in like so, just, just as exactly how I am right here. None of this funny stuff that people do, right? It's just gonna be here. If there's a balance issue, use a couch to the side and we're just gonna rock in. Now, I'm finding that I have no stretch feeling here, 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 and now I finally got it right here, all right? So now what I need to do is I need to challenge my end range, not yours, so everyone's gonna be different. And so I'm gonna add a little bit more, and now I'm gonna kick my foot towards the camera and do a little bit more. And this adds that internal rotation that we talked about. The good news is, is that after doing about 20, 30 of these, people tend to feel really good in the knee, uh, obviously, this is hard floor. I don't wouldn't want to have people do it on this, but uh, a lot of people think, well, wouldn't this hurt my knee because I'm pu putting pressure on my knee? Actually, surprisingly, no, because most people have their pain on the inner part of the knee right into here. When they start to rock into this, if you watch my knee, it actually puts pressure more towards the front outer part of it. So a lot of times it's pretty safe in that regard. And the bonus is you get hip flexor stretching, you get more hip extension, the hip capsule stretches. And so what happens is, is when you test that movement again, a lot of times the knee is automatically more tolerant because it's not taking so much rotation. But that is essentially how you find your medial meniscus. We've talked about what it is, and we've actually talked about a way to manage the pain too. Keep in mind that if something like this does work, it's not necessarily an end-all be-all. There is hip mobility and there's, there's hip function and hip strength. There's other things that you need to do to make sure that this does not happen again to you. And for the most part, usually people don't have uh, trauma associated with the meniscus, or at least they don't have a lot. It's just like they, they, they jumped down from a wall or they went running or they woke up with it. It's things like that. Uh, ACL is a little bit more traumatic. Uh, oftentimes, but there are atraumatic ACLs as well. So it's important to note that if you think about the big picture of things is why did this happen on this knee, not the other? I ran the same amount of miles. I slept the same amount of hours. Why is it happening now? A lot of times, if you really dig deep down, you have someone who's good at looking at movement. Hopefully you want to work with us on it. We can identify what's going on with the surrounding regions of the body and why this knee is taking up so much rotational load. All right. Uh, it's Ideally, in the long term, you need to have a, a specific program of exercises and activities to do throughout the remainder of usually about six months or so, but a lot of times it, it does form really good habits as well. So if you guys are looking for help, we'd love to help you through this. We do have free resources on the link description below. We change it at any point in time to make sure it's appropriate for what's going on with you. Um, and we're in Costa Mesa, California. We have virtual and in-person services. We'll see you guys next time.